The intrigue was painted by oil on canvas in 1890 and is in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, Antwerp, Belgium. A warm welcome to everyone. You're watching an overview of Intrigue, an exhibition about James Enser curated by Luke Cumans at the Royal Academy in London, from October 29, 2016 to January 29, 2017. The aim of this overview is to give a wider audience the opportunity to experience the exhibition, especially those who couldn't make it to London. I will show you a number of paintings exhibited and I will also analyze a few of them in detail. Some art historians branded Enser as painter of masks, but this would be a huge underestimation of his real talent. However, selecting just one part of his practice and dismissing others wouldn't fully represent his art practice. I hope that this exhibition contributes to the dispelling of such an inaccurate label. I applaud the Royal Academy for choosing to organize an exhibition about this less known artist and draw attention to his work. Interestingly enough, the exhibition was not curated by any curator, but by an artist, Luke Tumans. There are pros and cons to everything as well as to this choice. Some curators and artists are experienced in both art history and art practice. Some curators tend to have historical knowledge and they don't necessarily have to practice art. Artists, on the other hand, may have minimal knowledge of art history, but they can show a new approach in curatorial matters. Perhaps this was the reason why they were not usually labeled with a short description of each artwork in an exhibition. Apart from the titles and dates, the audience were drawn directly to the visual experience. I see James Enser as a very interesting jigsaw puzzle with many different pieces, and when you miss some pieces, you miss the real essence of his work or personality. He was a brilliant draftsman, skilled in drawing, painting, prints or etchings. Today, he is considered to be one of the best Belgian painters and printmakers. He laid the foundation to upcoming expressionism and surrealism which is evident in many of his works. In terms of the themes, they are directly linked to his personal life and very much represent his personality. James Enser wasn't definitely a follower or conformist to the mainstream art at that time, although he was influenced by a number of trends such as satire or Japanese prints. He was very much aware of his talent and refused to bow down to the popular trends of his time, which included impressionists or take seriously art critics rejecting his style or themes. Let's start briefly from his childhood. James Sidney Edouard, Baron Enser was born in 1860 in Ostend and died in 1949 in Belgium. His British father was a former engineer, failed artist and an alcoholic and was unable to support his family. Therefore, there was no so much of a good male role model and he had to carve his artistic career by himself. James Enser spent the majority of his life in Ostend in Belgium. This is a crucial information because his entire life and his work are directly linked to Ostend. Ostend, at that time, became a popular holiday destination for all those who wanted to have a dip in the sea. There was a new train track built to Brussels, so it provided an easier way of transportation. We will now explore a number of themes in his artwork. We will look closely at a number of paintings and show others which were part of this particular show. His time at the Academy in Brussels was understandably filled with clashes because he couldn't fit in. He always stood from the crowd, had his unique, new and original ideas which were ahead of his time and got rejected. This is not as surprising as artists were always pushing boundaries to unknown shores. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any evolution of artistic movements and styles. This oil on canvas and called Portrait of the Artist at his easel and was painted in 1879. Let's have a look at his self-portraits. This self-portrait is a painter tells us that Enser wanted us to know how he sees himself. Enser is looking straight at us with a confident look. He was always confident about his talent and he was serious about his career. There is a big palette with cloth in his left hand and a cluster of brushes in his right hand. On the other side of the painting, there is an easel with a cluster of brushes. Enser uses predominantly shades of browns, beiges, a small amount of red, along with mixed whites. The painting is painted with loose brush strokes and a palette knife. Especially on the beige jacket, you can see larger areas applied with a palette knife. The painting is well balanced. 
the easel diagonal line breaks the space across the canvas and makes it more asymmetric and more interesting. Another typical feature is the blending of colors between the objects and figure. Especially in the background, we can see there are maybe books, but the lines are not clearly distinguished. Enter preferred the looser application of paint when painting even though he was a brilliant draftsman which is evidenced in his drawings and prints. This image is painted by oil on canvas in 1883 and is called self-portrait in a flowered hat. Enter painted repeatedly his family, especially his mother and sister because he wasn't allowed to have models. His mother provided for the family and Enter seems to be surrounded and strongly influenced by her strength and morals. Obviously. His mother couldn't be overjoyed by her dysfunctional alcoholic English husband and the fact that the main responsibility for the provision for the family, including her husband's, was on her shoulders. She was also aware that models very often ended up in the beds of artists on a regular basis. We have an overwhelming record in the work of Picasso, Gagin, and a crowd of others. While the clothes were off, then boundaries, maybe even clothes, easily went out of the window. His mother simply knew human nature very well and wanted to protect her son. So let's have a look at this domestic scene with Ensa's mother and sister. They are well dressed, sitting around the table having a tea. The mother, depicted in profile, is holding a cup and looks down, not at us. My impression is that she would not have much faith in the success of her son who took after his unsuccessful father in an artistic career. Ensa's sister is depicted from the front view looks straight at us and has a much more optimistic look in her eyes and facial expression. Perhaps because it was before she had negative experiences in her life, which she had when her Chinese merchant husband left her one year into their marriage. She looks pretty, confident, with a symmetric figure hugging dress and a hat tied with a big yellow bow on her white collar. In the background, you can see the fireplace with the clock on top of it in the middle. Various objects are decorating the top of the fireplace. There are also two sofas on both sides of the room. The light is coming from the right side through the window and illuminates everything in the room. Emsa emphasized it by touches of white on his mother's and sister's cheeks, sofas, fireplace and vases. This painting is an evidence of both the significance of his family and also about his brilliant draftsmanship seen in the realistic depiction of figures and objects. We can, however, also spot his typical signature features, such as the loose application of paint with a regular blending of the colors. I love the depiction of the gray jacket that hangs casually on the left side of the painting at the back. Beige, the color of the wall, is applied to both the jacket as well as on the dark shadow further to the left. I think that the blending works in a sense of unifying the whole image. This is also a typical trademark if you like Ensa. Although he often depicts varieties of objects or people on one image, it is still a unified piece and it doesn't feel disjointed. Again, you can clearly see the use of the palette knife in the looser application of the colors in the foreground, tablecloth or background. The depiction of faces and details are handled more delicately. You are looking at a central and rather symmetric composition which works well on this occasion. This painting shows you his early talent with the ability to visually express just the right mood while drinking a tea. This painting, called Afternoon in Ostend, by Oil on Canvas, was painted in 1881 and usually resides in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, Antwerp, Belgium. The skeleton painter was painted by Oil on Panel in about 1896 and is in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, Antwerp. In the skeleton painter Ensa depicts himself with a skull instead of his face. He chooses to depict himself as a skeleton in blue trousers and top. Ensa looks at us directly with his palette and brushes on the left hand and painting a canvas on the easel with the right hand. Ensa placed himself in the middle of the studio, surrounded by many of his images, which at the beginning of his career didn't sell much, and are recognizable. He also followed in a long tradition of painting skulls and usually indicated memento mori reminding us of mortality. Skulls were mainly depicted in the still life paintings among other objects. However, Enter places the skull on his face, which was a completely new concept. It is actually puzzling what he really meant. Did he remind us of his mortality? Did he see himself as dead because he was rejected by the establishment? Did he point to the fact that underneath his face, 
there is a skull, one way or another, his choice of painting himself as a skeleton was unique. Interestingly enough, Ensor depicted himself as a skeleton in 1960. Well, he was right because in 1960 there was just a skeleton of him in his tomb. However, this was just one of the many varieties of themes depicted by Ensor. Many of his images are placed in Ostend and we will explore some of them. This image simply titled Ostend was painted in 1885. This painting is titled Bathing Heart. Afternoon, July 29th, and was painted in 1876. The Hagno 164 is an example of one of the first realistic paintings. Ensor was a colorist and a master blender. Sometimes in his paintings foreground and background blend, but at the same time, the viewer is clear on the distinction of the sea and the sky, which are painted in the shades of bluish, grayish or beige mixed with white. Notice that both foreground and background are painted in the same color range, but they are still clearly distinguished. This relatively small and simple painting indicates a number of things about Ensor. Firstly, the beach site was a reoccurring theme in his practice. The beach hut was carried to the very edge of the sea by horses and it would serve as a modern changing room. Bathers would change inside the hut before they entered the sea or emerged from the sea. During the summer there were dozens of such beach huts on the seafront and it was a very busy area, which we will see in another artwork, painted 14 years later. The cartoonish scene titled The Baths of Onstead was drawn in 1890. We see, apart from the sea, another sea. The second one is the sea of people being engaged in varieties of activities in the water or on the shore, doing all sorts of things. Let's have a look at the drawing, drawn unbelievably only by a few colors such as shades of blue, red and occasionally touches of yellowish. Let's have a look at the foreground where you can see a man sucking the tongue of another man. You can see straight away why this image was rejected at the time. Ensor must have observed all sorts of people visiting the seashore in his hometown and witnessed all kinds of behaviors, just as we can do today. Further up to the right, there is a bent lady welcoming us with a bare big thumb pointed at us. Triple B B B right there. Ensor left us wondering forever what she is up to. Fatting, defecating or trying to attract a man for sex? All options are viable. If you look towards the middle of the image. You will notice another bent woman clearly fatting, blowing her winds in public. Nobody seems to be bothered nor ashamed, though. Ensor wasn't shy of depicting people pissing, defecating, and fatting, as we all do on a daily basis. Except, those activities weren't chosen by the artists as worthy or acceptable to depict. So you can detect controversy right there. Ensor leads the way and did what others didn't dare to do regardless of criticism or rejection. On the left side, there is a water-shy crowd watching the spectacle of bathers in the sea. On the top of the beach hut, a man and woman watch through binoculars in order to see the sea spectacle in more details. Further up, on the top of another beach hut, there is somebody taking photographs of the bathers. We can see the whole spectrum of activities of people, including children together with umbrellas, toys, dogs and horses. There is also a boat with two people inside with two flags on the edges. They probably thought that bathing is the best occasion for displaying their patriotism. More than three-fourths of the image is dedicated to the foreground depicting varieties of people. At the top, less than one-fourth of the image is dedicated to the sky covered with clouds. I love how the foreground and background are connected and how the clouds are depicted as they would be emerging from the sea. The idea of delicate blending in the drawing, not only in the painting is detectable here. Finally, the sun with a human face, the same kind that children tend to draw, nails it at the top. This is the exact reaction I have when I look at this cartoon, I smile at a happy part of human life. I hope this cartoon brings a smile on your face as well. This image has its simplicity in the way the beach spectacle is depicted but at the same time has complexity in the variety of scenes and characters depicted. Despite it, it is a unified, brilliantly balanced piece which doesn't feel disjointed. I consider it to be executed at a high level of draftsmanship. To me, this cartoon is a masterpiece. Caricatures as an art form were at the time coming to the forefront of the Parisian art scene.
it should be noted that this type of depiction of cartoon including real naughtiness wasn't welcomed by the establishment. We, modern people, like to persuade ourselves about freedom of speech or freedom of expression improvements, however, some people were just recently persecuted or killed for similar cartoons and satire. It should also be noted that although now, after roughly a century, this image is exhibited by an establishment institution, as the Royal Academy still is, academies would never accept such image during Ems's life. Although the Royal Academy would probably wish to persuade us that times moved on, I wonder whether the Royal Academy would dare exhibit satire related to Charlie Hebdo? Or is it still politically incorrect and we will again have to wait another 100 years? Skeletons fighting over a hanged man was painted in 1891. The image depicts two skeletons figures in grotesque masks consisting of skulls and fancy hats with other props such as a broom, an umbrella or a stick. On both sides, there are onlookers and various masks watching the spectacle taking center stage. A hanged man is placed right at the center of the painting wearing a mask with a sign on his chest. Right below the hanged man there is another skeleton figure dressed up in a carnival costume and mask laying down. Two fighting skeletons indicate movement, but onlookers add to the impression that this image is frozen in a moment. Although Ensa uses bright colors such as red to complement green, blue or shades of browns mixed with white, the theme isn't so bright. The image invokes tragicomedy, leaving us puzzled at human intentions and behavior. Ensa worked well with a central composition which proves him as a master. His image isn't boring, quite the opposite. The viewers are left to wonder about the underlying plot of the image while examining all the exotic features of the dressed skeleton. Who was the hanged man to those two skeleton women that his dead body is worthy fighting for? Was he an ex-lover, friend? Was it just a play on the stage? Or the reason should remain a mystery? One way or another, Ensa got our interest on many levels. This might be the theme, exquisite quality in terms of painting with just the right color range and blending or central composition which was in fact avoided by some other artists in order for the image to be more dynamic. Ensa's paintings are dynamic even with central composition. One of the most interesting features of this painting is that Ensa may have watched the spectacle he invented and created and he might have been puzzled as well. All the props and masks may be a regular stock in his mother's gift shop for Ostend's annual carnival. Carnival goers would have a chance to buy from the range of mischievous products. Ensa used and depicted carnival objects in his images so they resemble exactly the ones actually sold. Therefore, themes such as puppetry, skeletons, carnivals, masks were common in Ensa's work. He was drawn by masks, bright colors, plastic material and potential mystery created by distorted proportions. Ensa even dressed skeletons up in his studio in order to create imaginary scenes, which was probably the case for this painting. This oil on panel is called Skeletons Fighting Over a Pickled Herring and was painted in 1891. This image is called The Astonishment of the Mask Was and was painted by Oil on Canvas in 1889. This image is called The Dangerous Cooks and was painted in 1896. This image is called The Bad Doctors and was painted in 1895. This still life is called The Skate and was painted in 1892. Ensa was not a vegetarian, but, according to his statements, he felt a kind of connection with the animals in nature. This is his quotation. What a beautiful phosphorescent dream, ending in beauty, tenderly embraced by a passionate squid. Situated amongst the cultivated muscles of Ostend and garrulous mermaids, I will surrender myself to the greedy kisses of the animals of the holy water, the earthly water and the sea water. In addition, his heart seemed to go out against the cruel treatment of the animals. This poster for the James Ensor exhibition at the Salon des Saint in Paris titled Demons Teasing Me dated 1898. This image is called Curaracias at Waterloo executed in 1891 in Indian ink, crayon, colored pencil and pastel on paper. Doctrinal nourishment is an etching printed image with tone and hand colored with white gouache and with red, yellow, and blue chalk and water color on paper in 1889 and is located in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. This image wasn't part of this exhibition, but it is a very accurate reflection of Ensa's radical attitude towards the church establishment.
I hope that you agree that this is an image like no other. I think it is absolutely a brilliant, accurate depiction of what many parishioners have been enduring for the past centuries. Emsa visually expressed what he probably experienced during the church service and I, with crowds of others, can certainly relate to it. Emsa, being observant, was aware of the corruption of the Catholic Church and there is no surprise that he wouldn't be brainwashed by its hypocrisy. He was also way too radical and way too outspoken, especially visually, to conform to the church structures. His uniqueness stood out and it would be a thorn in the eye. He expressed his views visually which was very different to church paintings of that period. One of the most overlooked themes in Ensor's work is the theme of Christianity. It seems to be politically correct to skip his large body of work with Christian including biblical themes or to skim it rather quickly. Christianity was obviously an integral, important and influential part of Ensor's life and work because we can see Christian themes reappearing throughout his entire life right to the end. This is one of the reasons why I see Ensa to the certain extent which was misunderstood until today, in the same way his depictions were not accepted during his life. Christianity is not necessarily the theme that would be politically correct to depict or talk about him even today, although there are obvious differences between Ensa's and our societies. The fascinating thing is that Ensa left a large body of art with Christian themes specifically about 70 paintings, drawings, lithographs and etchings. Therefore, one would naturally conclude he was a Christian. However, if you read a number of articles about Ensa, it was suggested that he was, in fact, an atheist. Based on his letters that he left behind, we've learned that religion and science are after all cruel goddesses, impregnated with tears and blood. This seems to be rather a poetic expression of his inner attitudes. I haven't read his letters, only fragmented quotations so I won't comment on them, nor draw any conclusions. I will, however, comment on his work of art with Christian themes. This huge contradiction between your visual encounter with Ensa's Christian themes and his alleged views may leave you puzzled. Ensa identified himself with the suffering Christ on the cross, or maybe he used his portrait for depiction of Christ to Brussels. Also, his paintings, Drawings or prints demonstrate an excellent knowledge of Christian themes, so he was definitely very familiar with biblical stories. Therefore, Christianity was in this sense an important reoccurring theme for his work. On first sight, one would suggest that the images were painted by a Christian. Based on the fair amount of his work connection with Christian themes and the way he depicted them, one can argue that he was perhaps, if not a Christian, at least agnostic. He couldn't be against Christ because he identified himself with Christ and he wouldn't be otherwise against himself. There has to be a distinction between disagreement with the corruption of the Catholic leaders and the attitude towards Christ. According to his work, he distinguished those two. This oil painting on canvas is called Adam and Eve Expelled from Paradise and was painted in 1887 and is originally in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, Antwerp. In his Adam and Eve Expelled from Paradise painted in about 1896, Ensa demonstrates that he is a brilliant colorist. Ensa was fascinated by light and observed it from a young age looking from the windows of his parental home. I will quote what he wrote about the light, I sketched those passing by, apples, blue bottles. All techniques are appropriate, graphite, aquarel, gouache. And, all at once the light comes bouncing in like a child that topples over tables, transforms bottles and glasses, shattering windows and dinnerware. Ensa spoke about light as if it was a living essence. In a speech from 1932, he admitted that, and I quote, I have no child, but light is my daughter, the light, one and indivisible. According to Christian teaching, Jesus, God identifies himself with the light. I am the light of the world. Ensa painted God as light. Although the title of the painting points out to Adam and Eve, they are actually depicted as tiny, almost unrecognizable figures blending with the foreground. The central stage of this painting is taken by nobody else but God who is painted as light. Light contains all other colors of the rainbow which are explored in this image. This oil on panel is called the Man of Sorrows and was painted in 1891 and is usually in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, Antwerp.
There are many depictions of Christ crowned with a thorn crown, but Ence's rather small painting is totally unique. We are looking at bloodied, wrinkled, disfigured Christ with rather an uncomfortable grimace of his mount. The predominant colors of this painting are shades of red, mixed with whites, occasionally yellows or blue in the face, there is a green strip on edge of the robe and yellow strip on the right side of Christ's shoulder. We are drawn to look at Christ's face full of suffering and we probably even don't know rationally why. To me, this is one of the best painted faces of Christ in the entire history of art. It could be summarized in one word, suffering. Christ's hair is depicted through scratching into the paint which was applied before. This creates a good impression of individual hair. The features of Christ's face are emphasized with the thin red lines for wrinkles, eyes, nose or mouth. Yellow touches above the thorn crown indicate a halo of light coming from heaven. The red background is broken down by patches of white applied with a dry brush, leaving us to see red coming through it. Colors have always had special symbolism and red, the color of blood, was a symbol of suffering, sacrifice or love. The choice of the red color links this image well with the message of the shedding of Christ's blood for the sins of the whole humanity because of his love for us. White is a symbol of purity, and Christ wearing a white robe was a symbol of the only sinless creature on the planet. Enter proved to be a master in the fact that he left the red strip which in turn makes us to be drawn to Christ's face even more that if the whole background would be the same. The yellow strip resembles the sun rising from behind of Christ. This painting titled Christ in Agony was painted by Olon Panel and is from the late 1930. This painting titled The Fall of the Rebel Angels was painted in 1889. This etching on paper is called Christ's Entry into Brussels and is dated 1898. There are a number of interesting facts about this image. Emser actually painted the future because the image was done in 1888. As you can see from the title, Christ will come into Brussels about a year later. Overall, it is a very busy image with a number of themes included there. Christ with a halo, is almost unrecognizable in the middle, riding donkey. Ensa depicted Christ with his face. Ensa lived during a period of great social and political unrest in Belgium. The image is filled with the crowds on the street carrying banners emphasizing different trends and causes. I think that the main connection between Christ's entry into Jerusalem and Christ's entry into Brussels is that nearly nobody considered Christ to be important enough to pay attention as everyone went about their business 2,000 years ago. This is the entry of Christ into Brussels in 1889 painted by oil on canvas in 1888 and is originally in J. Paul Getty Museum, Los Angeles. This painting was not in the exhibition but I included it in this overview because you can see the difference with the prints, which is in reverse. Emsa was an international celebrity in his final years and became baron in his native Belgium. This was in a stark contrast with his early artistic rejections. Ensa left roughly 900 letters which provide a good insight into his mindset. We know that he doubted the goodness of man and the ideals of the Enlightenment. In addition, he was no unbiased proponent of modernism. Ensa left a big question mark about some of his images and left us forever wondering as to where he came from. Therefore, he is still a misunderstood jigsaw puzzle although we attempted to uncover and put it together. I hope you've enjoyed learning something new about such a complex and less known artist. Thanks for watching an overview of Intrigue, an exhibition about James Ensor curated by Luke Dumans, which has been rated 5 out of 5 by Global Coolness. This overview has been dedicated to Charlie Hebdo victims and all those around the world who were persecuted or discriminated for satire.